أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونسلم على رسوله الكريم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرأ بسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق صدق الله العظيم اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم وصلي عليه الصلاة والسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا سيدي يا حبيب الله First of all I'd like to congratulate you all for being part of this mafil <coughs> and most of you are sa'id tikaf so it's uh, double congratulations I hope you're making the most of this uh, Just on the few words that Brother Ibra said about me um, it's got nothing to do with me. It's just being with the, in the presence of uh, noble men like uh, Qibla Mufti Sahib. And uh, it's just by being with these people, like um, one of the translations of Miyam uh, Ahmad um, Bakhsh, they said that if you see, that he sees in the sea, that even the the iron bars of iron flow when they when they put on wood so normally iron bars they would sink straight into the ground if you put them onto the wood even they stay afloat so it's just by remaining close to people like these that eventually Allah Ta'ala gives you he gifts you by being with these people I don't know anything myself all I am is I'm just a parrot I'm just telling what I've heard everything that I hear I just tell people there's nothing special in this, it's just passing information from A to B. I'm passing it on to you, one day you will pass it on to somebody else. We're just a means for each other. So the topic is connecting with the Quran Sharif. First of all, just a brief introduction to what the Quran Sharif is. The Quran Sharif is the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in the shape of the words via Hazrat Jibreel alayhi salam. That's a simple trans uh, explanation of what Quran Sharif is. Now the Quran Sharif has several benefits to it. The Quran Sharif has several, a lot of history to it. But I just want to focus on a few things. But just before we look into the Quran Sharif, the Quran Sharif was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ, like we say, was revealed a common question. If the Quran Sharif was revealed on the 27th, so why do we say that the Quran Sharif was revealed in stages? Because we say Quran Sharif is revealed in parts and it was revealed, uh, some was revealed in Makkah Sharif, some was revealed in Medina Sharif. But why do we say, Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr? Why do we say that the Quran Sharif was revealed on Laylatul Qadr? Simple explanation is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descended the full Quran Sharif to the heavens of the sky, to the first heaven on the night of Qadr. And then after that, every time a ayat, a portion of the Quran Sharif was appropriate to that situation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Hazrat Jibreel al -Islam to take this down and deliver it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So just a very simple explanation. Now reciting the Quran Sharif, a very famous hadith. When you read the Quran Sharif, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, for every letter you get ten rewards. And the Prophet sallallahu said, Alif, Lam, Mim is not one letter. Alif is one, Lam is one and Mim is one. So you get 30 just for reading Alif Lam Mim. Now because you're in Itikaf and it's the month of Ramadan, month of Ramadan, all the good deeds you do, all the Fars, you get a reward of 70 Fars, all the Nawafil, you get the, farz, you get the reward of a Fars. So the more Quran Sharif you read, you can't even imagine how much Sawab you're getting. So try to read as much Quran Sharif as possible. Now the Quran Sharif is one of the miracles of the Prophet Sallallahu Now miracle of the Prophet Sallallahu is something that they had done in their life that was out of the ordinary. Something that cannot be possible for any other normal human being. That's called a miracle. Every miracle of the Prophet ﷺ was for a specific time. When the Prophet ﷺ split the moon, the people there saw the moon split and then join again. When the Prophet ﷺ returned the sun to the time of Asr, the people there saw it. And after that, it became a narration. Similarly, all the other, when the Prophet ﷺ, when water began to gush forth from the fingers of the Prophet ﷺ, that was a miracle, but only for that time. Now, all of these miracles, the scholars say, they were not according to the status of the Prophet 
They say only two miracles were according to the status of the Prophet Number one, there was Mi'raj. When the Prophet ﷺ went to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they went to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second one is the Quran Sharif. Now even out of these two, one of them, the Mi'raj, was for that time. And now it's a narration. Although it's true, we believe it's true, but it's a narration. The only living miracle of the Prophet ﷺ is the Quran Sharif. And it's one of the greatest miracles to have been given to the Prophet ﷺ. But you're never going to realize this is a miracle until you study it, until you look into it, until you pay attention to it. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over and over again impliedly and explicitly tells us to ponder over the Quran Sharif. Like in Surah Mulk, when we read Surah Mulk, it says, Tabarak Allah biyadihil mulk wa huwa ala kulli shayin kadir. We read this every day. I'm here when you guys read it, somebody reads the Arabic, somebody reads the translation, and everybody listens to it. Now, even in the first few verses, there's a very strong emphasis on reflecting. Look how Allah Subhanahu wa Taala teaches us. Because Tabarak Allahzi, this surah, from here up to the end, these surahs is the last part of the Quran Sharif, and it's focused heavily on the hereafter, on changing yourself. It's on a wake-up call. Because if you're in a deep sleep, a small alarm clock won't wake you up. You need big bells, you know, the church bells. You need them to ring in your ears. So this is a strong message, very, very strong messages in these last two para. So it starts off with Tabarak Alladhi biyadihil mulku wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. The first thing Allah Ta'ala teaches us is Tawheed. First thing, Allah Ta'ala is one. He is the owner of everything. He is the owner, the kingdom is His. The next thing He tells is, Alladhi khalaqal mawta wal hayata liyabluwakum ayyukum ahsan wa mala. Now this means, very simply, Allah, it is him who has created death and life. You must all know the translation by now. And it's him who's created death and life so that he can test which of you is better. Now, one of the subtleties here is why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention that he created death and life? Why is it in this order? Because normally, as we see it, we are first born and then we die. So in reality, the order, according to us, should be He created life and death. But the order here is death and life. This is the hidden beauty of the Quran Sharif. There's two explanations of this that the scholars say. Number one, they say it's emphasis on death. That for you to die, you need to be alive. But as soon as you will be alive, the first thing that's sure is you're going to die. You don't know how long you're going to live. But death is a certainty. No matter which faith you're from, or if you don't have any faith, nobody can deny death. That's one of the opinions. The second opinion is that mouth doesn't refer to death as we know it of. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about some people in the Quran Sharif and he says, they're alive, but they're dead. They can hear, but they don't hear. It's people that are alive, Allah ta'ala talks about the, the kuffar, he says they're alive, you see them, they're breathing. They can hear, they talk, they walk, but they're dead. And he says about some people, the shaheed, apparently we see them, they've been martyred, they're not moving, they've been buried. But Allah says, don't even think about them being dead. So it's something else Allah is referring to here. So mouth can be referred to as lifelessness. When something isn't alive, because when we read the dua, when we wake up, the dua when you read after sleep, you say, thank you Allah, brief translation is, for giving me life after death, after I had died. We hadn't died, we were lifeless, we weren't moving, anything happened around us, we were completely unaware of it. We weren't dead, but the words used here in the Hadith Sharif is mouth, after we had died, so it refers to lifelessness. Now here, lifelessness can refer to before we were born. Our souls were created all, but before we were born, we were lifeless. We didn't know what was happening. We were not aware of what was happening. So some of the scholars say, Allah khalaqal mawta wal hayata. Allah Ta'ala created the previous lifelessness and this life to test you. Now he wants to test you. And then the Quran Sharif, the way to do tafsir, I just want to give you a taste basically of how we do it 
you know, in the Dajjal and I mean the classes of how we study the Quran Sharif in Tafsir and how we pick out subtleties and how it, it gives another aspect to the Quran Sharif, how it beautifies, how we see things and how much of it it puts into context into our lives. So Tafsir, the way it's done is there's a few ways, but the first, the, the main, the majority, the first thing that a scholar looks for is he takes one ayat of the Quran Sharif and he looks for other ayat that may be explaining the same subject. If you don't find that, then you go to the ahadith and then you go to the different criteria. But here, Allah Ta'ala says he created death and life in order to test us. How will he test us? Elsewhere in the Quran Sharif, Allah Ta'ala says, we shall surely test you. So he says, we shall surely test you. Again in this, because most of you are not familiar with grammar, there's a lot of subtleties in grammar hidden into this. But it means we shall most definitely test you. With what? And then it's a very famous ayat, most of you would know it. We'll test you with fear, we'll test you with hunger, with loss of provisions, loss of people around you. We're going to test you with all of these things. But we're not going to test you with all of them on one person. One person might get hunger, other person might get fear, another person might lose his beloved. So every person will get tested in his own way. Moving on to Tafsir of Surah Mulk, move next verse. It says, Alladhi khalaqa sab'a samawatin tibaqa. It is him who has created the heavens, seven on top of each other. Yeah? Shows the creations of Allah SWT. Now, he Allah is showing us the reasons. He's, given, he's giving us reasons to believe in him. He's showing us signs. He said Allah is one. Okay, fine. But how do I accept that? Okay, look at the sky. Look at the seven heavens. Hal taram in futur. Allah Ta'ala asks, do you see any mistakes? Do you see any faults? When you look, you say no. There's no faults. Everything looks brilliant. There's no pillars holding the sky. There's no holes. There's no cracks. There's nothing. Hal taram in futur. Do you see any mistakes? No. Then Allah Ta'ala says, look again. Look at the sky again. Reflect on it again. Now here the hidden message is, look at the creation of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and reflect upon it. If you don't see any mistakes and if you feel you're being sidetracked, look at it again. Reflect. It's a very strong lesson here. Then Allah says, look again. Then he says, Thumma rji'il basar. Then he says, look again a third time. Look, can you see any faults? You won't. You won't see any faults in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The message is very, very strong here. Is first, Tawheed. Second, remember your death. Third one, reflect upon things around you. It's only by reflecting that you'll get the true meaning of life. You'll get the purpose of life. Now that was very briefly on Surah Mulk. But because there's a lot of youngsters. Um, the Surah Adiyat, which some of you may be aware with. But just like to share a few verses of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the Quran Sharif. How Allah ta'ala uses different techniques to get the attention of people. And these same techniques we see being used around us in advertisements. These same techniques. Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Adiyat, <coughs> He says, Wal Adiyati Dabhan. Now, every time Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala takes an oath, there's a reason for the oath. The oath, there's two parts to an oath, very briefly. So if I say, I swear by Allah, I sat on a chair. I swear by Allah is the object of the oath. I swear by Allah. So I sat on the chair is the subject. They're both linked in the Quran Sharif. Every time you get an oath, the subject and the object of the oath have a link in common. So Allah Ta'ala says, Wal adiyati dabhan. Very, very simple meaning is when you see the horses and when the horses are panting. Wal adiyati dabhan. And the horses, by the horses who are panting. Panting means when the horses are running really fast and they're out of breath, they're breathing very, very loudly. Very brief. I'll give you a brief translation and then we'll look at it in detail just to show you how tafsir beautifies things. And the sparks 
coming out from when they're hitting the, the ground, the hoofs, the sparks of fire. Allah Ta'ala describes them. فَالْمُورِيَاتِ كَهْدَحَنْ فَالْمُغِيرَاتِ سُبْحَنْ And ambushing in the morning. فَأَثَرْنَ بِهِ نَكْعًا And the effects of this, with the effects of this, you see a dust of cloud raising. Now for those of you who haven't come across the translation before, you're thinking, what's this? Why, the, why is Allah SWT talking about horses and sparks and ambushing in the morning and the dust of cloud rising? And then the enemy reaches, penetrates. Yeah? Now, let's put this into perspective. Because it stops here and then Allah Ta'ala begins to talk about something else in the next few verses. Now to understand this, because on the face of it, most of you look confused. Um, because if you don't study this surah, you won't understand. You'll just see that Allah Ta'ala is talking about some horses that are running and they're panting and you see sparks and that's it. And you just move on. You won't pay attention. You just move on and say, oh, let's read the next verse, what it means. But if you look at the tafsir, there's just a bit of explanation beforehand to understand. The Arabs, now this Quran Chief has been recited, is being read to the Kufar. Yeah? So the Kufars loved three things. <clears throat> they were obsessed with war, they were obsessed with poetry, and they were obsessed with animals. They loved the camels, they loved the animals, the horses. Now Allah SWT here wants to get their attention, to get a message to them. So he mentions something that they're very interested in. They're interested in war, they're interested in poetry and animals. Now all of this, Can you hear the rhyme? It's rhyming. So number one, the first thing is there. Second one, It starts off with animals, horses. Some say it's camels, because camels were faster. So they liked camels. And then the third thing is war. What you see is you see speed and then the, at the end, they reach the, the enemy, they penetrate the enemy, they're inside. Now, just by hearing these things. So, they say it's, Adiyat is a group of uh, horses, less than 10, just a few of them, and they're running really fast. Let's put this into perspective. You're hearing the Quran Sheaf, imagine the Kafir is hearing the Quran Sheaf being recited. The picture is, he has in his mind. So, he says, the horse is running really fast. You can hear the horse panting. You're the rider. You can hear it panting. It's running really fast. And you look down, you can see from the hoofs, sparks are coming out, sparks of fire. So you're going really fast. Yeah? You're going really, really fast. You can hear it. You know, audio is there, video. Allah Ta'ala is building it up. Then Allah Ta'ala says, Fal Mughirati Zubhan. Allah Ta'ala says, then they ambush, the ambushing in the morning. Now think about the ambushing. There's less than 10 of them. They're ambushing somebody in the morning. What's the best time to ambush somebody, to attack somebody? At night, when they're sleeping. In the morning, everyone's home. People are getting ready to go to, to work. They're getting ready to, to do their things. Everyone's awake in the morning. So they're ambushing in the morning. So here implies that the confidence they're going with. There's a, there's a few of them and they're going when the enemy, they're all awake, they're all at their homes. So they're going to attack. فَأَثَرْنَا بِهِ نَكَعًا Now they're going so fast, you look down, sparks, you look behind, you see a dust of cloud rising behind you. Now imagine, if you're going in the morning, in deserts, what happens at night? Dew falls. If you're going early morning, the soil is going to be wet, it's going to be moist. So this horse is going so fast that just with one strike, the moisture is evaporating and the sparks, come, sparks of fire from the ground. Think how fast it's going. فَأَثَرْنَا بِهِ نَكْعًا and فَوَسَتْنَا بِهِ جَمْعًا Now the enemy reaches, no, the, now the animals and the rider reaches the enemy. It's come inside, surrounded by enemies, full stop. Next verse, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لِرَبِّهِ لَكَنُودِ Surely man, human, is to his Lord ungrateful. Look at the message. Look how it's drawn the attention. Now just to put this into our perspective, how we would see it. So imagine, you see horse, fast horse, 
the punting. What comes to your mind? You see a supercar, somebody's revving it. Yeah, you see that on TV. You see it every time. He's revving it, you see the revs, eight, nine, eight, nine, you can hear the sound. From the exhaust, you see sparks of fire coming up. Yeah? And then when you're driving, you're driving early morning, the sun is rising, it gives you a good scene. And the next thing you see is the car zooming past and you see dust of cloud behind. Yeah? When you see the dust of cloud, it's gone. And now you see the car stopped at the race, racing point, at the departure line. As soon as they set off, you see the dust of cloud finished and it says in cinemas next week. It stops you there. Why is it there for? It's to catch your attention. As soon as you're into it, as soon as you think, oh, I want to see the race, pff, black screen. Then the message is there. That's the message. Book your tickets now. Yeah? That's exactly the same theory that's used, that they use in advertising campaigns, that's used in Surah Adiyat. Now, when I read it the first time, how many of you would have imagined that it was so, ch so detailed? You have to do dua for the scholars, the mufassir, who have put so much effort into looking into these surahs, to looking how beautiful they are, and how they play with the human psychology, even without us knowing it. How beautiful. And then Allah Ta'ala delivers the message. Surely human is ungrateful to his Lord. Even that is hinting back at the animals. Because the animal is running and he knows he's going to get hit. He knows he's going for war. But he's still going. He's not throwing his master off and going back. So Allah Ta'ala is saying, your animal is going. He's helping you out in situations of war. But how bad is human that he's forgotten his master? The message there is very, very powerful. And it's beauty and subtleties like this that make you fall in love with the Quran Sharif. And it's just about us realizing this, giving the Quran Sharif a chance. You'll never see the beauty of the Quran Sharif unless you give it a chance. You need to give it a chance to sink into you. Otherwise, no matter what you have in front of you, the Kuffar, Abu Jahl, Abu Lahab, they saw the Prophet but they didn't accept. Why? Because they didn't give it a chance. They didn't let it come inside them. We need to give the Quran Sharif a chance to come to us. We need to make at least some kind of effort to understand the Quran Sharif. Only then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will change our lives. Allah Ta'ala says, you make the effort. Like Muhtab once mentioned, they said when Hazrat Maryam was, uh, was pregnant and she, was, she left the place, she left, she went into solitude and she went close to a, a tree. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to her, you hold the tree and move it. Now why, and then you will see fruits falling. Why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just send the fruits down? And it was a palm tree. How much can you move a palm tree? It's solid, especially a woman moving a palm tree. It's impossible. She can't shake it to drop the, the fruits. The message here is make the smallest effort you can. No matter how small and the fruits Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give. That's all you have to do. Make the smallest effort. Even if it's just making the intention today, intention of what? Of reading the Quran Sharif a little bit every day. Even reading the Quran Sharif with the translation. Because Musa mentioned this many times. They say we have saved the Quran Sharif to kill people. How? Somebody is about to die. Surah Yaseen Kardoji. Surah Yaseen Paro. Why? So he dies easily. Quran Sharif isn't here to kill you. It's here to give you life. So don't just keep Surah Yaseen to make death easy for somebody. It's true, you should do it. But let's, let's not just confine it to reading at that time. Let's use it first to keep us alive, to give us life inside. What time am I? 6.43. Um, what time am I finishing? 7. That's fine. So inshallah, if you give this a chance to sink into you, to, to come inside you, and we do courses here. I'm sure brothers would have told you we do courses. The students are at the kaf as well here. So if you ask them, we do tafsir classes, we do other classes, many, many. It's going to change your life. It's changed the life of many. And uh, inshallah, it's going to change your life. It's because you're connecting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now I'll just mention another surah. The surah that follows surah Adiyat is Al-Qari'ah. On, on the face of it, this surah is Al-Qari'ah, a loud noise. mal what is a loud noise? And what's going to make you know what a loud noise is, what al-kariya is. So 
very very brief three verses very very strong but very brief you don't understand them they seem very shallow but if you look into it al qari'a means a loud noise a very loud noise some the arabs used to say tara al bab when somebody used to hit at the door with a stick to knock to wake somebody up that was called qara al bab very loud banging on the door they also say the al qari'a is also referred to as the noise that you know when the slaves would get hit by the masters when a human body gets hit and you go ooh that noise that was called al qari'a as well but one of the things that the quran sharif has done when he came he coined terms what does it mean it means before quran sharif before islam salah would mean something else hajj would mean something else now since the quran sharif has come salah only means worshiping allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facing the qibla as a muslim that's salah hajj used to be anybody performing a pilgrimage a religious pilgrimage is called hajj but now it's only those who are traveling to makkah mukarrama to perform hajj in zul hijjah so the quran sharif coined terms now here allah ta'ala does the same thing in this surah al qari'a when he said to a kafir he would have heard al qari'a he thinks okay a loud noise some might think you know somebody hitting on the door when somebody is hitting on the door and you're sleeping inside what happens first thing you wake up second thing is you're scared you don't know who's there and third thing is you feel insecure you don't know what to do you don't know where to go because you're just woken up yeah so you're confused now all of these meanings are implied but then allah taala says mal qari'a what is al qari'a so here refer, allah taala is implying that the al qari'a you think that's not what i'm referring to i'm referring to something else mal qari'a what is al qari'a then allah taala says wa ma adraka mal qari'a what's going to give you the slightest hint of what al qari'a is you wouldn't have a clue now the kafir is confused he doesn't know what's al qari'a i want to know so he wants to hear more man that's another way of bringing people of getting attention you say a pound coin what's a pound coin nobody in this room knows what a pound coin is that's it everybody is going to start listening what's a pound coin they want to hear same thing here they knew what al qari'a was but allah taala says what is al qari'a you don't know what's going to make you know what al qari'a is and what is it yawma yakunu an nasu kal farash al mabthuth the day it's a day when the people will be like scattered moths yeah there's a lot of description into this but just a few is a day when people will be like scattered moths we see in the hadith that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said there will be so many people on that day that you will just have space to stand on your two feet that's it that's how many people there will be because if you imagine people from hazrat adam alaihi salam all the way until the day of judgment will be the greatest gathering ever at the same time present and what's going to be happening the loud noise what's the loud noise the loud noise is when the earth shakes there's earthquake the earth is shaking these people have been have come out of the graves and they're screaming they're shouting they're trying to run into run into each other the mountains are collapsed into each other the earth, the the moon and the sun are collapsed into each other imagine the noise it's a lot of noise that's a lot of noise you can imagine if you go to a to a place if you go to hajj and how many of a million people there are if this 3 5 8 9 if they all start screaming together imagine the the noise levels if there's billions of people at the same time running screaming shouting because they stood on copper floor the floor is very very hot nobody is going to stand still so imagine that and you've got no space to stand alone to stand on there but on that day you will feel the loneliest despite being the greatest gathering ever that day you will feel the loneliest ever and people will be like scattered moths now moths are scattered anyway you see much of the flying about they're not together they're not like you see birds they're together no they constantly you know they've spread but allah taala says scattered so this adds to the loneliness that you will feel on that day that's why allah taala says mabsus scattered 
So it adds to the to the fact that how lonely you will feel on that day. Why? Because everybody will say, I am for myself. Nobody's going to want to talk to anybody else. Kids, parents, brothers, sisters, friends, nothing. Just me on my own. Now, on that day, now imagine, put the, putting these two things together now, al and people like scattered moths. Imagine everybody in the graves, there's a loud noise, all of a sudden people running about. The wind come out the graves and they're running into each other. Imagine this table was filled with moths. I got a stick and I hit it. What would happen? What's going to happen? They're going to fly away, they're going to go into each other, they're going to hit into each other, everything. That's the image that's being created here. People are in their graves, al a loud noise. It could even refer to the trumpet. As soon as the noise happens, people are out of their graves. The ground is very hot, the sun is very close, there's no space, people running into each other. People like scattered moths. Look at the irony there. Loads of people, but they're still described like scattered moths. Allah Ta'ala here is talking about psychology. You will feel alone. Now, the psychology, even in Surah Mulk, I left that, a bit of psychology. When the people thrown into the hell, you've seen the verse, haven't you? You've heard the, the verse when, Kullama ulkiya fiha fawjun. Every time a group of these people are thrown into the hell, they'll be asked, did the warner not come to you? What's the reason? They're being thrown into hell. Why do they need to ask? It's been decided. This is for mental torture. Allah Ta'ala is referring to mental torture. He's creating regret in their minds now. Why? Because they've wasted the chance. They said, definitely, somebody came. Of course, somebody came. But we didn't pay attention. This is mental torture. Another point in there, there's astrology in Surah Mulk as well. The few verses before that, when Allah Ta'ala says, وَجَعَلْنَا هَرْرُجُومًا لِلْشَيَاتِينَ Allah Ta'ala talks about the, the stars and he says we created stars to beautify the sky, to beautify it. Also, what did it make it? وَجَعَلْنَا هَرْرُجُومًا لِلْشَيَاتِينَ We made it as a punishment for the shayateen. Now the scholars have two opinions on this. One, they say the jinn shayateen. What they used to do is people, the foretellers or the so-called foretellers they would say, okay, we'll find out your future. What they would do is they would ask the jinn to go to the first heaven and hear what the angels are saying about such a such person. And they would come back and they would tell the person. And he would then pass, in, pass the information on, saying he's very pious, showing, you know, I know it. Similarly, once in the hadith, the Prophet went to one of them and he said, uh, the, and the Prophet said to him, they said, what name of surah have I got in my mind? Which surah is, is it? What name is it? What's the name of the surah that I have in my mind? And he was saying, Dukh, Dukh. And he was stuck there. And the Prophet cursed him and they said, You can't cross your limit. The Prophet had surah Dukhan in the mind. But he was only being told Dukh by the shayateen. That's all. Now what's happened since the, since the Prophet wasalam, every time these, these shayateen tried to go to hear something, they hit with fireballs. Some say that in the shooting stars you see, and these are shayateen being thrown down. And people say, make a wish. Shayateen being stoned, and you say, make a wish. But anyway, even in this, rujum al shayateen, so the shayateen are hit. When they try to come, they hit. Another opinion is that they say shayateen here could refer to the people. Because some people are shayateen, some people are evil. But how? Rujuman. Here, like Allah SWT says in Surah Kahf, he says, rajman bil ghaib. The people were guessing how many people were in the cave. The people of the cave were the, were the three, with the dog, or they were guessing numbers. And Allah Ta'ala describes it as rajman bil ghaib, wild guesses. They're just guessing. So here the same word is used, rujuman li shayateen. What they're doing here is people are looking at the skies and they're, they're making guesses. What guesses? Astrology. So horoscopes, and they're saying, okay, today your day will be very pleasant. And you will spend the day in this way, that way. Horoscopes, astrology. Referring to astrology here. But if you just read it, you see, Rujumali Shayatin, you read it as a punishment for the Shayatin and you're gone. You miss it. You won't see that astrology is there as well. There's two meanings in there. So it's important you read it with tafsir because every time you come across it, then it makes you think, it gets your attention straight away. You think, look how much depth there is in this verse, in this phrase, in this clause, how much depth there is. 
Back to Surah al qariah So on that day when people are like scattered moths, يَوْمَ يَكُونُ النَّاسُ كَالْفَرَاشِ الْمَبْسُوسِ وَتَكُونُ الْجِبَالُ كَالْعِهْنِ الْمَنْفُوشِ And you see the mountains like carded wool. So they're like carded wool, you know when you comb the wool and it becomes weightless and it starts floating. You'll see the mountains float like that. But the only thing is here, it's not just one type of wool. عِهْن manfush refers to different types of wool. Now what does it mean for us? It means mountains, normally what you see is mountain in one range, there's one type of mountains. Different range in a different part of the world, it's a different texture. Some are rocky, some are you know, covered with snow. Now what the description here is, is the mountains from everywhere. Mountains mixed from different places because they're different, they're different texture. You only find one texture in one range. So it means all the mountains of the world, they're crushed into each other and made weightless. Now imagine them crushing into each other. That adds to al qariah That adds to the noise as well. So you see the mountains floating. But it's amazing how the mountains become weightless on that day. And Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Kahf that he will, that the good deeds have weight, will have weight on the day of judgment. So... Normally when you do something, if there's something in the way, there's a branch in the way, you pick it up and you put it to the side, people will say, oh, what are you doing? It's just one neki anyway. It's just a little thing. There's no point. It's just one neki for you putting it to the side. But on the day of judgment, a big mountain will be weightless, but that small neki will be extremely heavy. Look how everything changes on the day of judgment. All of a sudden, Allah Ta'ala makes heavy what He wants and makes light what He wants. It's just another example of how Allah Ta'ala is able over everything. Then Allah Ta'ala says, يَوْمَ يَكُونُ النَّاسُ كَالْفَرَاشِ الْمَبْسُوسِ وَتَكُونُ الْجِبَالُ كَالْيَحْنِ الْمَنْفُوشِ فَأَمَّا مَنْ ثَكُولَتْ مَوَازِنُهُ فَهُوَ فِي عِيشَةِ الرَّادِيَةِ And for whoever the scales is light. فَأَمَّا مَنْ خَفَتْ مَوَازِنُهُ فَهُوَ فِي عِيشَةِ الرَّادِيَةِ Because if your scale is light, it's going to go up or down. Worldly, up. Yeah. So if you... I won't go into too much detail. I'll end up confusing you. But if your skills, if you've done good deeds, then فَهُوَ فِي عِيشَةِ radiya, Then you will have a pleased life. Why does Allah SWT say a pleased life? Not why. Why doesn't He say pleased? You'll be pleased? No. Because there's difference in how to please people. You may be pleased with one thing, but it may not please me. I may be pleased with something, but it won't please you. Some people may be satisfied with clean water, they're pleased. Some people may not even be satisfied with a fridge full of drinks. He Allah says, pleased life. He doesn't say you will be pleased. Your entire life will be pleased. You won't, it's complete. There's no, there's no, there's no other loopholes, there's nothing. It's complete, your life is going to be pleased. The life after the day of judgment is going to be complete, your life will be pleased. Then Allah Ta'ala says, And for whosoever skills are light, the first one was heavy, this one is light. What's going to happen? Um refers to mother. Um means mum in Arabic. Fa ummuhu haviya. Um means mother and haviya is the fire. Now pause for a moment and think why does Allah Ta'ala say the fire will be his mother? Now when a child has been separated from his mum and he sees his mum after a long time, what does he do? He's going to go running to the mum. Yeah? The mum is going to welcome him with open arms when he comes. It's going to hug him and then not let him go anywhere. Now imagine the fire doing the same thing. Somebody is being thrown into the fire. The fire is reaching for you. It grabs you, envelops you and then it's not going to let you go. So the description here. And what, do you, what will make you know what here is? It's a blazing fire. 
Now this blazing fire is, tra it's, is, is explained in Surah Humaz of Allah Ta'ala says, it's a fire lit by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. It's been ignited by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Now imagine if the fire was lit by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. If I was to light a fire, <coughs> I won't be able to burn much. I don't think I'll be able to burn this bench. That's how bad I am with fire. If you ask somebody who knows how to light a fire, if he was to light a fire, he'd probably burn the building down. If you ask a scientist to create an explosion with something probably this small, it'll blow up a city. And then if he was to make preparations properly, look what happened in Hiroshima. Destroyed. Generations to come have been affected. Now imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made preparations for this fire. It's beyond imagination. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made preparations for this fire and he has ignited it himself. As soon as something is linked with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it becomes unlimited. So you can't imagine how serious the fire is. It's well beyond our comprehension. So it's very, very important we, we learn the Quran Sharif. Why? Because it's going to save us from mistakes. It's going to save us from mistakes. It's going to build inside us the love for the Quran Sharif. We're going to think, okay, I've read this surah. Now let's read another one. See what the beauty here is. Because this is a dynamic text. Every person, this applies to every person individually and every group. And the whole Ummah at large as well. And that's the only book in the world that can do this. No other book can do this. Now the, another advice is, when you read the Quran Sharif, never ever think that the Quran Sharif is just for people who are learned. Educated people. It's for everybody. It's for all the Muslims, even for the non-Muslims. Don't think, oh, I need to study the Quran Sharif with someone, otherwise I'm not going to read it at all. No, you need to read it yourself. If you don't understand anything, then you ask somebody. But never ever think the Quran Sharif is for the learned people. It's only for them to read it, to take the maslia, prepare speeches, prepare dars, prepare this and tell us. No. It's for all of us to learn and to pass on. It's all our duty to connect with the Quran Sharif and then because we're living in a non-Muslim state, it's our duty to portray the right image of Islam. Because when we go out there, if we have a beard on our face, people don't know us outside. The people outside don't know me. But when they see the beard, and when they see the heart, the image of Islam comes to them. So when you're outside, you're, nobody's going to say, oh, such and such person was spitting on the floor. They're going to say a Muslim was spitting on the floor. A Muslim was driving like an idiot. A Muslim was doing this. Then you're giving Islam a bad name. You have to be very careful of what actions you do in front of non-Muslims. Be extremely careful. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala forgive me for anything wrong that I've said. For surely it's come from me. And may Allah Taala accept for anything that correct, anything good that I've said, and give me first the chance to implement it, and then all of us to implement it in our lives, and give us the tawfiq to build a very strong relationship with the Quran Sharif, and to study from teachers like Qibla Mufti Sahib, and to stay in their company. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillah rabbil alamin.